Once again, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here to continue our study. You know, the, the Lord uses individuals to wake people up. Sometimes he even uses those who are opponents of truth to wake up the people of God. Consider, for example, during ancient times, the kingdom of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, an unbeliever. Nebuchadnezzar, a man who's full of himself, king of Babylon. And yet, the word of God informs us that the Lord used him to wake up the people of God. In the course of human history, there have been times when the people of God needed to be aroused to the condition that they were in. The time that we're studying is such a time. Those who profess to be Christians are currently not in a good condition. And the Lord will use instruments to bring about correction and change among his people. For this reason, we've been talking about this seminal event of Luther, what we say starting the Protestant Reformation. Now, in the first night, we discussed Sola Scriptura, and we understood the context of Luther from his early years until he finds the Bible and makes the decision that he will live by the Bible and the Bible only. From there, we went to a study of what the Bible did to him and his teachings until the point that he nails the 95 Theses to the door. And tonight we're going to see the consequences of this with a study of a third sola, which is sola Cristo, or Christ alone. <laughs> so what makes Luther unique? Why do we say that Luther started the Reformation? There were reformers before Luther, Huss, Jerome, Wycliffe, there were, there were reformers, the Waldensians, the Albigensians, there were those who attempted to make reform before Luther. What makes Luther different? What are the circumstances around Luther that we need to understand? So for example, as we were studying the Bible, we found out that for Luther, the Bible was an unknown book. It's hard for us to understand that. I mean, there's a Bible everywhere today. Most people have it on their phone as an app. Everybody's got this information today, so it's hard for us to appreciate that in Luther's time, they didn't have Bibles. Many people didn't even know that there was such a thing. Luther, studying at the university, finds a Bible by accident. In finding this Bible, he has transformation. Why? Let's review a little bit so that we can have a good understanding as we start today. Romans 10, 17 says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so Luther is able to have an impression of scripture that changes his life. And that's why he says those famous words, unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept any other authority than that authority which is found in the Word of God. To him, what is the Bible? The Bible is alive, he says. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. A simple layman armed with Scripture is to be believed above a pope or cardinal without it. Now, it's interesting, we use the term pastor, it comes from a shepherding role, and we use the term minister. What is a minister? It's, a, it's kind of knowledge to have. What's a minister? Minister it comes from a word meaning servant. So ministers of the gospel are simply servants. Do they have any more sanctity than any layman. 
in the church? Is there more sanctity to a minister than there is to, lay, to a lay person in the church? Absolutely not. It's a calling. The calling to ministry is a calling to be of service to others. So think of a minister as the servant or the chief servant to those who are in need. But when it comes to gospel truth, is gospel truth limited to those who are in ministry? Absolutely not. What we find in Luther's teaching is that anyone who has access to God's word has access to the truth. All you need to do is learn how to, how to read. That's it. And the truth is yours. Psalmist says in Psalms 119, 130, the entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. Which is why the Apostle Paul was not ashamed of this simple gospel that he had received. As Luther reads the word of God, what happens in Luther's life? John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And Luther begins to realize that he personally has access to the truth. What we learned, though, is that as a result, when he went to Rome in 1510, he did not discover there what he thought. He thought he was going to the New Jerusalem. He thought that in going to Rome, he would go to this wonderful and amazing place full of people who are studying the word of God, full of people who are embracing truth. In fact, it was just the opposite in his experience. And upon returning to Germany, Within a, short, within a short while, he was confronted with indulgent sellers trying to raise money for St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, in Rome. And now he has to confront this. Luther's desire is not to start a church. Luther has no desire to start a church. But he does have a desire to bring reformation to his church. And so he confronts this with what we call today the 95 Theses. Now, Luther has a purpose in posting these. Luther's purpose in posting these is academic. Luther would like somebody to debate him. So what he does is he puts these resolutions on the door of the church in Wittenberg. He also sends it to his superior and within a short while people start making copies of these theses now actually luther is very frustrated because you know what doesn't happen you know what doesn't happen nobody says to luther i would like to debate you on these points his whole purpose was to start a conversation <laughs> and discussion to invite people, let's have a debate on these points. But nobody comes forward. His superior in the church doesn't even reply to him. The superior simply sends the theses on to Rome. And he says, I need somebody to help me give an answer to these questions. Now remember, it's the 1500s. How long does it take something to get to Rome? It's a long time, people. You gotta carry this by foot. There's no horses. There's no Pony Express in Middle Age Europe. So this is done by individuals carrying a piece of paper from monastery to monastery as somebody's available. There's no mail system. There's no postage system. There's no Pony Express here. It takes a long time. In the meantime, Luther keeps teaching. And the church does not stop him because he is an official of the church. He's an official within his order. What makes Luther unique from the reformers that came before is not Luther himself. It's not even Luther's message. What makes Luther unique 
is that Luther presents these theses right after the printing press has been developed. And unlike Haas and Jerome, Wycliffe and others, who were reformers, their messages were generally contained geographically. And the church, within a short time, was able to circle the wagons around them and shut it down. <clears throat> the difference here is that these theses begin to be printed and distributed. This did not happen with the writings of Huss, Jerome, Wycliffe, the Waldenses, because those writings had to be copied you know, by hand. <laughs> no one's going to do that. But this could be printed on the press. And in a short while, sufficient copies could be made. Within a few months, the theses are circulating throughout Europe. Within a short while. Everybody's talking about these theses. They're debating these theses with everybody except for who? Who is the only person who nobody's debating these things with? Luther. Luther. They're debating everybody else. They're having conversations. In universities, students are debating this. In theological faculties, they're deb everybody's debating this with everybody else except for the guy who actually asked, debate me about this. He's the one who nobody's talking with. This is a problem for him. And so Luther, go ahead here, Luther is finally, almost a year later, is finally called before the church to give an answer. In 1518, the decision comes from Rome. Luther's writings are heresy. The 95 Theses that teach that you are saved by grace alone, that teach that indulgences have no value, these are heresy. So he goes to Augsburg, where he's been charged, and he's going to be tried before Cardinal Cajetan. He's going to use arguments that are based on the Bible, he refuses to use the church canon in his defense. Now, the cardinal has a problem. Do you know what the cardinal's problem is? Cardinal has never read the Bible. Cardinal's never read the Bible. He uses church canon law to defend the position of the church. The one thing that he's not able to answer Luther is in scripture. This is a problem because Luther refuses to accept anything except what? Except that which is in the word of God. It's really hard to have a debate when the two of you, when you and the other person cannot agree on what is and is not source material. So. It's almost like having a debate in two languages. Like if you were speaking in Portuguese and I was speaking in English and we had a debate and we screamed at each other a lot, but I have no idea what you said. And you scream at me a lot, but I have no idea what you said. This is basically what happens. We have two men talking from different source material. Luther, who will only debate from scripture, and the cardinal, who doesn't have the necessary knowledge of scripture to give answers, and relies completely upon church text, canon law, for his position. Nonetheless, the cardinal orders that Luther should be arrested. Well, Luther manages to escape, and he will flee to Wittenberg under the protection of Frederick the Wise. Frederick is one of the electors of Germany, the ruler of the land, and he's going to protect Luther. The following year, Luther is going to accept an invitation to go to Leipzig for his first actual debate with somebody who knows scripture. Oh, he's happy now. Luther is happy. He's finally 
now almost two years later, almost two years later, he's finally going to get the debate that he has been seeking. A debate with somebody who knows scripture. He will debate Professor John Eck at Leipzig. Here's the problem. Eck continues to try to force Luther to accept that the church has the right to make teachings in addition to scripture and that the church has the power to change scripture. Luther keeps saying, but I thought we were going to talk about indulgences. I thought we were going to talk about justification. I thought we were going to talk about salvation. And Eck keeps saying, whoa, <laughs> first, you have to admit that the church has the right to administer scripture, to deny scripture from some, and even to alter it if necessary. When Luther refuses, the debate kind of breaks up. <laughs> Luther understands that, righteous, that the righteousness of God is a passive righteousness which God justifies us through faith, and that's how we receive it. At this point, things are not going well. The consequences of publishing these 95 theses continue to get worse. In 1520, a full three years after their publication, there will be a papal bull. The papal bull is called Exurge Domine, and when it arrives, it gives Luther 60 days to recant or to be excommunicated from the church. So Luther is told, you have 60 days to recant what you wrote, to say that what you wrote is wrong, or else you will be excommunicated. Now, at this point, Luther is getting a little frustrated, yes? He is trying to reform his church, what he considers to be the, the body of Christ. He wants to reform it. And now he's getting a little bit infuriated because that church is telling him that they're going to kick him out of the church. So he takes the bull, the papal bull, and a copy of canon law, the church rules, and he burns them. Maybe a little dramatic, yeah? At, at this point, Luther is getting yeah, a little bit dramatic, and Luther says, look, I need to send a message. This is wrong. So he burns it. He then proceeds to write three famous, famous works. One is to the Christian nobility, the second is on the Babylonian, Babylonian captivity of the church. And the third is called the freedom of a Christian. He will now produce these three pieces. One is for common people. One is for the leaders in the church. One is for leaders in the state. Trying to explain to them what it is that he believes. So that he would have some backup. In 1521, he will be called by the civil rulers to arrive in the city of Worms, where there, I know it's funny in English today, right? Worms, but nonetheless, that's the name of the place. It's called Worms. And the Diet of Worms, consider it kind of like a parliament. So they've gathered together to make decisions for the land. And among the leaders there, they make a decision that they need to settle this issue with Luther once and for all because the religious authorities want the civil authorities to make a decision for them. It is at the Diet of Worms in 1521, that in April of 1521, that Luther will give the famous words, which we've read a couple of times. I wanna read them again now, so we have them in the right historical context. So now, before the rulers of the land, Luther makes his stand and says he will not recant what he wrote unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason I do not accept the authority of the popes and councils for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God 
I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. The decision results in his excommunication from the church. And in May of 1521, he will receive an excommunication by the papal bull Decet Romanum Pontificem. And he will be condemned as a heretic and an outlaw. Now, here's a fundamental point I need you to understand. Luther did not leave the Roman Catholic Church. There is a misconception that Luther left the church. This is not correct. Luther has no, I, no uh, inclination of starting a church. The idea of a Lutheran church at this point is not something that's even close to his imagination. He believes that he's going to bring reformation to his church. So I need you to understand, Luther did not leave the Roman Catholic Church. Luther was kicked out of that church. Any consequences that occur afterwards have to be placed upon those who removed him from the fellowship of the church. So he does not say, oh, I think I'm going to start a church and I'm going to name it after myself. And uh, let's go and start the Lutheran church. This is absolutely not the case. Luther is attempting to reform his church and his church will excommunicate him. He is removed from fellowship. Do you understand the difference? It's a pretty big difference, yes? Yeah? Like if I, if, I, if I run away from home, is one thing. If my parents kick me out of the house, that's a totally different thing. This is the situation that we're in. Luther has been kicked out of the church at this point. Now, the church is after him. He's a heretic. A person who kills him will actually, according to the church, receive an extra bit of grace, an extra bit of merit. And if you kill Luther, you'll spend less time in purgatory as a result. Luther's life is forfeit. On his way, Luther gets kidnapped. He'll be kidnapped. He's kidnapped by his friend. <laughs> He's kidnapped by the elector, Frederick, Frederick the Wise. And Frederick is going to bring Luther to Wartburg Castle, where Luther will grow a beard and go by the name of Squire George. So now Luther is basically in hiding. Luther the priest, Luther the leader within the Augustinian order, is now Squire George. Now, in this time, he actually is very productive. In 10 weeks, he translates the entire New Testament into German, from, from Greek into German. So he's very, he's not sad, he's not, you know, just moping around. He says, look, I need to be productive during this time. And he will actually use this time to translate the scriptures. Why? Because he wants common people to be able to understand why he teaches what he teaches. See, because he's preaching, but most of the people, when he's not there, they can only accept whatever the priests are telling them. And Luther realizes the only way that the true message will be able to get out is if people can read for themselves. So he translates the New Testament, takes about 10 weeks, and sends it to the press, where they now begin to mass produce the Bible for people. People can now read the truth for themselves. Fundamentally then, what change occurs once the break with Rome is complete, 
Luther can no longer depend upon the church. Until now, until this moment, even though he has been teaching salvation by grace, even though he has accepted scripture as his rule of faith, he has still felt the protection of the church. That's been removed. At this point, Luther can rely only on one thing. The only thing that Luther can rely on is his relationship with Jesus Christ. He has nothing else. He has no church. He has no pope. He has no cardinals. He has no bishops. He has no priests. All that remains to Luther is God's word and his personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing else remains to him at this moment. There's no such thing as a Lutheran church. He hasn't started a church at this time. But once you break that tradition, then other things begin to break away as well. And so whatever could not be found in scripture needed to be put away. This is why Luther now relies on his relationship with Christ as a determining factor in what he will believe and now begins to test all faith according to scripture. Once you accept that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, you must accept that there is no other mediator between God and man. The fundamental difference then that occurs in the teaching of Protestantism as opposed to the teaching of Roman Catholicism is the notion that somebody else could intercede on your behalf. Luther and the Protestants who follow recognize that there is no other mediator than Jesus Christ. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now the word man that's used here by Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 6, is the Greek word for universal man. In other words, what we might say, mankind. So there is no created human being. From Adam until today, there is none that can bring you to the Father. Only one, and that is Jesus Christ. There is no other mediator between God and man. The church has been teaching that individuals can intercede for others through the purchase of indulgences, that you could intercede for somebody else. Additionally, the church has been teaching individuals to pray to the saints, to pray to Mary. Now, while we should respect those who have given us a good religious example, and while we should look at their lives and study them, Scripture gives us no indication that they have the power to intercede on your behalf. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we are clearly told that neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No one else can save you. No amount of prayers to another created being will save you. There is no other mediator. To prove this, I want to read from 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. And I understand that this is one of those points that is often controversial or difficult for 
some to understand. It's comfortable to pray to saints. It's comfortable to pray to Mary because these are created beings like us. And so we feel some affinity there. We give them a little bit of extra power in our mind. But the reality is that they cannot mediate for us. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Scripture gives no opening for anyone else to mediate on your behalf. This Protestant principle of mediation was central to the formation of all Protestantism that you have today. You have access directly to God through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other mediator. If you sin, don't pray to anyone else. If you sin, there is only one place to pray. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. There is no other way. There is no one else that we can pray to. There is only one mediator between God and man. Why? Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Speaking of Christ, it says, He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The whole entire purpose of Christ coming to this world, living in this world, giving the perfect example in this world was so that he could be your intercessor. To replace Christ with some other intercessor goes against what is written in Scripture. And thus, following that principle that Luther has decided on, that he will believe in what is in the Bible and the Bible only, there can be no other mediator. Hebrews 12, verse 24. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So yesterday we mentioned that in the old covenant, do you remember? Yesterday in the old covenant, in order for sins to be forgiven, what needed to happen? Blood, right? Without blood, there's no remission of sins. There cannot be. So in the old covenant, you killed the spotless lamb, and the blood of that lamb interceded on behalf of the sinner. In the new covenant, Hebrews tells us, we have a better sacrifice. The better sacrifice is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. His blood intercedes on our behalf. When we ask for forgiveness, we ask it in the name of Christ because, as we see here, he has that blood of sprinkling that can be given to us. I'm trying to say this in a kind of, you know, trying, trying to say this in a way that's not going to come across too rough yet. But the reality is that no matter how good a saint was, still a man. Still a human being. And no matter how good Mary was, she is still a created being. And scripture tells us that all... The word is absolute, yes? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In any case, neither 
neither Mary nor the others gave blood in, for sacrifice in the biblical system. Therefore, they have nothing to offer. The only thing that they have is their experience to help you with your experience. But in matters of salvation, there is no help that they can offer because scripture tells us that this blood is the requirement. Then when you pray, there is only one place to pray. Solo Cristo. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12 says that you pray directly to God. There is nothing that can separate you from access to God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. You have the opportunity to confess your sins directly to God and to receive forgiveness directly from him. In Revelation chapter 22, we have an experience there because this idea that you can worship to saints, to, to holy people, that you can worship them, venerate them, and so forth. This idea can, is, is extra biblical. In Revelation chapter 22, John the Revelator is in the presence of an angel who has never sinned yet. No sin at all. An angel who has been sent to give him insight. After receiving insight, John beholds the glory of this angel, a sinless being. And John kneels down in front of the angel. What does the angel, who's never sinned, what does the angel reply? Revelation chapter 22, verses 8 and 9. I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Verse 9. Then said he, the angel, unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. Even angels who've never sinned refuse worship because worship is due only to God himself. There is no other mediator that we have. So where did the saints come from? Where did this worship and ideology come from? There's a book called The Triumph of Christianity by Rodney Stark. And what he does is he traces a variety of different modern teachings that are extra biblical. So what he does, he goes through various Christian denominations and he takes teachings that are not found in scripture to try and find their origin, where they came from. Among them is the worship of saints. Since there is no worship of saints in scripture, what he does, he tries to find its roots. And he did. In early Christianity, as they were conquering pagan lands, the new religion was now being incorporated into these pagan populations who had a multitude of gods. Most religions did not have one god. The majority of pagan religions had a multitude of gods. So when Christianity arrived there, in order to amalgamate Christianity to local customs, this is what Stark writes. He says, the peasants tended to respond to Christianity as they always had to the appearance of various new gods within paganism, to add the new to the old rather than to replace it. Hence, Jesus and various saints were simply added to the local pantheon. So the local god of the sea became 
the saint for the sea. And different names were given and transitioned onto local pagan deities. They have no basis in scripture. They have no basis in Christianity, but they do have a pagan background. This background is one that Luther realized could not be sustained within Christianity. In order to have a sola scriptura faith, you had to have a belief that salvation was through Christ alone. Should we pray then? If we're not praying to saints, should we pray? Is there a necessity of prayer? In 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 11, it says, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Should you be praying? Absolutely. You should be praying. To whom? To the Lord. What about the notion of repeated prayers? For example, the rosary. Or saying the Our Father over and over and over again. The Hail Mary over and over and over again. Does this meet the scriptural test of something that would be of benefit to you? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, just prior to giving the Lord's Prayer, what does the Lord forbid as part of the Lord's Prayer? This is from the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. When ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. What does the Lord say? You are not supposed to have repeated prayers where you simply repeat again and again the same words. And then continues in verse 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask them. <laughs> Don't just vainly repeat prayers. Your father knows what you need before you ask. And so when you pray, there is a formula for prayer. And that formula begins, as many of you know, in verse 9, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The formula for prayer then is given to us. Who we should pray to is given to us. There is no necessity of vain repetition of prayer. And there is no instruction to pray anywhere else except to the Father. That's why in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says that we must be careful with our prayers because we really don't even know what to pray for. In Ro Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 26, it says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints, according to the will of God. So our prayers are made possible because of the intercession of the Spirit of God. Who else needs intercession? Just to be clear, I want you to notice here, the saints need intercession. According to Romans chapter 8, verse 27, the Spirit makes intercession for the saints. Then prayer to the saints is of no value. They themselves require an intercessor. It's kind of like going to the source in prayer. It's like playing the telephone game. Why would you pray to somebody who cannot answer your prayer and needs intercession themselves in order to pray? Why not pray directly to the Lord? 
When should you pray? Always. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. Always. If you ask, what will happen? Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 24. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Our prayers then are to the Lord. The consequence of the 95 Theses was that indulgences became a secondary issue. As the theses were spread around, people began to examine all doctrine in relation to Scripture. And so Luther was quickly joined by Calvin, Zwingli, Knox, and a host of other reformers. Unlike the previous attempts at reform that were local in their scope, this reform that Luther began produced a large amount of fruit. People now had access to the scriptures themselves. Access to the scriptures meant that they could test doctrine according to scripture. That means, by the way, that you should test doctrine. Even like, the, whenever I do this at the end of this series, then they say, why are you doing this, right? But what we talked about here, you should not accept until you tested it. Do you understand? If you went through these days and at the end of it, you said, wow, I like that. I accept that. Then you're not a Protestant. <laughs> because if you're a Protestant, Every message that you hear, you compare yourself with Scripture. You read Scripture. You say, is this consistent with what God has written? And if it is, then you accept. In Scripture, there's a group of people who do this. Some of you might remember what they're called. They were from a town called Berea. They're called Bereans. And when the Bereans heard the Apostle Paul speak, Scripture tells us they loved what he said. They loved it. But even though they loved it, what did they do then? They went home. They compared it with what they had, which was the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. They compared it. They found that it was true and then... They accepted it. Look, I, I love being here. Don't get me wrong. I love being here. I love sharing this message. <coughs> but I got to tell you, I'm like, I'm nobody. I'm just Dave. Everything that we talked about here, you need to study. Everything we talked about here, you need to confirm with Scripture. Because if you will study for yourself, then your conviction is between you and your God. That's the essence of Protestantism. It is a church without a pope. It is a church where its members themselves are convicted of truth and gather themselves together for fellowship, for support, for comfort, <coughs> to give praise, to the honor and glory of the kingdom of God. This is the essence of Luther's Protestant Reformation. Individuals having access to God's word, able to appreciate what God has done for them. We can summarize the solas then in this way. The scriptures alone give us evidence that we are saved through grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, to the honor and glory of God alone. And it's my wish and my prayer that you will have that same experience. Luther died February 18th of 1546. In the meantime, 
he had challenges, he had difficulties, he faced trials, he went through periods of depression, and in all of these, he was able to persevere because of his acceptance of Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. As every trial came, as every difficulty came, he submitted it to that power which was greater than his own and was able to persevere. That same power is available to you. You too are able to have access directly to God's word. You too can pray directly to your heavenly father. You too can receive forgiveness of sins, assurance of salvation, an assurance of acceptance into the body of Christ, an assurance to be part of the kingdom of God. That is available to you. And no man, no man should stand in the way of your personal salvation. I hope and pray that you will accept the great gift that God has given you, the gift of Jesus Christ. And that as you accept this gift, you'll receive the transformation that is offered and experience that. But then, once you've experienced it, I hope you'll share it with somebody else. Because there is a world that's desperately in need of a Savior. And I hope that you will be the person who brings it to them. Amen. Amen. I, I really want to thank the Lord for the opportunity to share this history with you, to share the doctrines that the Reformation produced, and I hope that you will continue to study. And for that reason, I'd like to conclude the same way that we've concluded the previous two nights, to pray the way that they prayed during those times. And those who are willing and able, I'll invite you to kneel down together with me and thank God for giving us his word. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for many blessings that you've given us. We thank you for the word which you've given to us and protected for us. We thank you that we live in a country where we have freedom and peace to be able to study it. Help us, Lord, to not take that peace for granted, but to appreciate all the blessings that we have. We ask, Lord, also that you would help each one of us here to recognize the great gift that has been given through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And help us, Lord, to not only accept this, but also, Lord, by faith to share it with others so that they can have that same beautiful experience of a personal relationship with you. We ask, Lord, that as you gather your people together, that you will bring us into contact one with another. Help us to be someone who is a help to others. Help us to reflect your grace in this world. And we ask, Lord, that as we leave this place, that you will help us to appreciate scripture and study it more for ourselves. We ask this today, Lord, not because we're worthy, but because we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.